are taking a break from our, our series on Romans. We're going to be in Titus chapter 2 this morning. And, um, I, mentioned, I mentioned Florence, our, our senior pastor, is a very brave person. He, he like flew over Florence to go to a wedding in Virginia. So uh, good on him. That's very brave. Um, oh, yeah, anyway, that's why I'm here. Here I am. And, uh, and I want you, as we start to, to think about Titus and, and what Paul is going to say in this little section, um, I want to bring up the whole Nike ad campaign thing, right? You, maybe, you've, uh, maybe you've seen a meme on Facebook. If you, you know, there's all kinds of memes out there around this, but the whole idea that they've done is um, they've got this ad campaign with Colin Kaepernick, who was an NFL quarterback and is, I think, still looking for a job as an NFL quarterback. Now he's got a new job with Nike. And uh, the whole ad is uh, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And um, it's had varying degrees of polarization. You know, now either people want to burn their Nikes or they want to buy stock in Nike. And it's very, very divisive. And I'm not here to talk about politics this morning at all. What I want to do with that is actually say that I think Christians should have just come up with this a long time ago. Right? This, this slogan believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything, in all seriousness, this should be the, the slogan of Christians for the last 2,000 years. Because here's the deal. If you go back and you look at the way Christianity began, almost all of the apostles, if, if you read the history around them, almost all of them were martyrs. They almost all died for their faith. And the, the one we know for sure that didn't die for his faith was John, and they tried to kill him, and it didn't work. They believed in God's word because they knew Jesus. I mean, they, they lived with Jesus. They knew him, and they believed God's word to the point that they were willing to sacrifice everything. That's why Tertullian, one of the church fathers, says the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Wherever there's blood spilt from martyrs, the church grows. It doesn't divide, it grows. Uh, that's why, fast forward ahead to Martin Luther, who, when pressed by, by the powers that be in the Roman Catholic Church to deny his works and his, and his statements on the gospel, he said, here I stand, I can do no other. And when he said, here I stand, he meant on the word of God. Uh, that's why even today, in other parts of the world, like China, like North Korea, there are Christians who are being imprisoned and dying for their faith because they believe in this thing, in this God, so much that they're willing to sacrifice everything for Him. Believe in something, believe in God, and believe in His Word, even if it means sacrificing everything. Why? Because it's a matter of life and death. It truly is. There's, there's no other way to say it. It is, this, this book, this Bible, is special revelation from God that reveals to us, it's His revealed word, of how to find eternal life, of how to know Jesus Christ, who Himself is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one will come to the Father except through Him. This is the only way to know that. And that's why it is a matter of life and death. And that's why in, in Titus 2, as we come to our text, the first thing Paul says is, teach this stuff, preach this stuff, tell everyone about it, because it is a matter of life and death. So let's go ahead and read our text, Titus 2, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to look at the right screen this time. Didn't do that this morning in the first service. Paul writes, You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young man to be self-controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what is good and your teaching show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned 
so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. So if you don't know uh, anything about Titus, Titus is a young pastor who lived on the island of Crete, way out in the Mediterranean. And he was pastoring a church there, and Paul was his mentor, and Paul's writing this letter to him. Uh, and, and one of the first things he says in this letter, in this little section is, teach sound doctrine, or as the Greek says, teach what is consistent with or what is fitting with healthy doctrine. So that begs the question, what is healthy doctrine? doctrine. Well, I would say it is the core, the core truths of Christianity, the gospel truths, the gospel story that, that God is a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and He is the creator of all things. And that in His Word, we find the infallible, inerrant, authoritative Word of God. And that this Word teaches us that we are actually sinners who are in need of salvation, and we can't find it anywhere else but in Christ. And, that, and this Christ, this Jesus, is the Son of God who was born of a virgin, who came and lived a perfect life and died a horrible death on a cross. And then God raised him from the dead. He is risen, and he reigns and rules, and he's established his church, and he is coming again to establish his kingdom in fullness. These are, this is the story of, of the gospel. And there are so many other truths that the Bible teaches, but this is at the center. And that's what I believe Paul has in mind when he talks about healthy doctrine. Now, there is lots of other truth out there. I'm not saying that there is no other truth other than in the Bible. You can find truth in a science book. You can, you can find truth in a newspaper. You can find truth on even on Facebook sometimes, every once in a while. But when it comes to truth about eternal life, when it comes to truth about how to find forgiveness of sin, there is only one place, and that is God's Word. Because only in God's Word do we come to know, or through God's Word, do we come to know God Himself. We come to know Christ. Now, there are many different interpretations of God's Word, are there not? I mean, how do you know which interpretation of God's Word to believe? So, healthy doctrine, the way, the way I think of it, healthy doctrine is always going to glorify God. It's always going to have God's glory as the main intent. It's always going to put God at the center of the story. There are a lot of interpretations of the Bible, though, that are man-centric, that put man at the center of the story. And I think that's what Paul has in mind when he brings brings this up in 2 Timothy 4, uh, 3 through 4. He says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. If you look hard enough, you can find a Bible teacher who will teach you essentially whatever you want to hear from the Bible. You will find, if you want to, a teacher who will scratch the itch behind your ear, who will make you feel good with the way he teaches the Bible. Um, our denomination is, is called the PCA, Presbyterian Church in America, um, and it's a, it's a denomination that's only 45 years old. In 1973, we split off from our, our mother denomination, which is now called the PCUSA. And if you were to do some research, you'd find that we are very different in what we believe. And the key difference that started this whole split was that the PCUS decided, we're not going to believe that the Bible is an error and infallible anymore. We're just, we're just done with that. It's outdated. And now what we're going to do is we're going to say, if we like what it teaches, we'll believe it. But if we don't, then we won't. And the, P, and, and the men and women of the PCA said, that's too much. That's a breaking point. We, we have got to split off. Um, and so that's what I think Paul has in mind when he's talking about teachings, interpretations of the Bible that, that itch our ears. If it's man-centric, if it does something like what the PCUS did, and, and they say, we get to determine what's true and what's not out of the Bible, 
that, that kind of puts man in an authoritative position over God, which is very dangerous. And so we want to make sure that our doctrine is not what we believe because, because it suits our passions. We want to make sure that our, our doctrine is God-centric. Because that, if you read the Bible, is what the Bible teaches. It's that God creates. It's that God makes an everlasting covenant with his people. It's that God loves us and is merciful to us despite our sin and our rebellion. It's that God sends his son Jesus to rescue and redeem us. It's that God sends his Holy Spirit to dwell within us and that God is establishing his kingdom and that God will one day remake this world into a place that is perfect and that when he does, we will not even need a sun anymore because he will be so bright, he will be all the light we need. God is at the center of the story. God gets all of the glory. Hallelujah. We are passive in all of this. And that is good news. If that is true, if that is what healthy doctrine is, then it is life-changing because it is a life-and-death issue. It is something that we should pursue just like when Jesus tells the parable of the hidden treasure in the field. You know that parable where he says a man goes out into a field and he finds a treasure buried there and he, he runs off and he sells everything he has to buy that field because he knows if I get that field, then that treasure is mine. He, does, he goes all in on the treasure and that's the way that we ought to view God and his word, going all in on living our lives with this at the center, with God at the center. And so what we find is that when this life-changing, healthy, sound doctrine is, is taught and is, and is at the center of our lives, we find transformation of whole communities. See, Paul here in Titus 2 envisions this sort of mentoring program happening where mature believers are mentoring younger believers in the ways of the faith and, and how to follow Jesus. And that's what we're going to get into now. Now, I wanted to say, when you think about these categories that Paul gives, he doesn't list age limits. Like, he's not saying, if you're 50 plus, you're mature, and if you're 50, below 50, then you're young. What, he, what he's saying is actually more about spiritual maturity. So, like, you could be 70, but new or young in the faith. And so maybe you still have a lot of growing to do. You could be 25, but you could be very mature in the faith because God has has been working in you for a long time. And so it's not so much about age limit. It's more about character traits, and in particular fruit of the Spirit in your life. But let's start. Paul first addresses uh, mature men. And I, and I think the defining characteristic he lists is that mature men are sound in the faith. Um, so w when healthy doctrine is taught among mature men, here are some different things that you're going to see, Paul says. The first thing is, is temperance. And, and when you think of temperance, you're thinking of um, not doing anything in excess. You're, you're thinking about someone whose satisfaction is found in God and in God alone. That's, that's where you, you get your fullness. You get it from him, not from something else. Um, he also lists being dignified. What do you think of when you think of a dignified man? You think of like maybe a godfather, v Vito Corleone. Yeah, yeah, Santino, you're the bad dog, yeah. Well, the Godfather was, was dignified, but he, he also had some questionable moral stuff going on, like putting out hits on people and stuff. Um, so I don't know if that's what Paul has in mind here. I actually think dignity here is it, something that comes from God, right? It's not, it's not something that comes from having lots of money or power or strat, strength or status. I almost just said stratus. Just combine strength and status into one word. But um, it, it's, dignity comes from God. It comes from knowing that you are God's man. That he has saved you and he has brought you into his family. And because of that, you have an amount of dignity that you can't really comprehend. It's kind of like if you were an ambassador for a king. You go and you, you give the message of the king and you actually are respected and you have the dignity of the king, even though you're not the king. You're his representative. You're his ambassador. I think that's what Paul has in mind here. 
Another trait is that mature men are self-controlled. They are disciplined. They have mature judgment. They're also sound in the faith. They're sound in faith, love, and endurance. So let's tackle those three things real quick. I think being sound in faith is really just resting in God's sovereignty, trusting Him. No matter, no, no matter what happens, you, you are at peace because you know and love God. Sound in love. I think that's about your attitude towards neighbors. You look upon other people the way Christ looks upon those people. You know that just like you, they have faults and they have issues and they can be hard to love sometimes, and yet you want to still love them the way Christ loves them. And then sound and endurance. This is about how you think about trials and difficulties. A mature man in Christ is, is almost never going to be controlled by his circumstances. A mature man in Christ, a mature man in Christ is going to See his circumstances when they are difficult as a trial that, that the Spirit is leading him through to strengthen his faith. I'll sum it up and, and say that a mature man is a Hebrews 10.23 man. Hebrews 10.23 says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. If you've ever seen the movie Master and Commander, there's this great scene where this kind of old sailor, it's, it's a movie about... Um, British sailors in, in the Navy in like the 1800s. You know, so they're on a big like old pirate ship or whatever. And so this old man, he's a sailor. He's got tattooed on his knuckles, hold fast. And there's a scene where he's like, there's dangers about, something's about to go crazy. And he's holding fast. He's, he's showing knuckles and he's kind of just smiling like, I got this, you know. And, and that's, that's what I always think of when I, when I see this verse. And I think about holding fast the confession of our hope. A mature man in Christ holds fast to the confession of his hope even amidst the storm-tossed trials of his life. What about mature women? I think the defining characteristic is gospel reverence. And I want you to be very careful to notice that it is Paul and not me who uses the word older. He says, sound doctrine. Here's what, here's the effect it has on mature women. He says that they are reverent in behavior. Reverence brings up, in my mind, Ephesians 5.21, which says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Reverence is a it's, it's the idea that in your life, in your conduct, in, in the way you talk, it is evident that Christ is your master. That is what reverence brings up to me. You, you are always looking to him. You want to serve him. You are, you are sitting at his feet, learning from him the way Mary did in that, that story of Mary and Martha. Uh, the next thing it says is that mature women in Christ are not slanderers. And this word in the Greek is a very interesting word. It's the word diabolus, which if you know any, any Latin or Spanish, sounds a little bit like diablo, which means devil. It's a scary word, right? He's saying don't be devilish in your speech. What does it mean to be devilish in your speech? Well, it's stirring up strife with the way you talk. It's, it's, it's gossip. It's, it's talking behind each other's backs. It's being very subtle and, and almost attacking in your communication. And he's saying that mature women resist these temptations. Rather, a mature woman has speech like what Proverbs 16.24 says, which is that that's kind of speech that is sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Next, he says they are not slaves to too much wine. You can take wine out and put anything else in there. They're not addicted to anything. They're not addicted to wine or money or, or work or, or Netflix or Instagram. They are mastered by none but Christ. So then he says, they need to teach what is good. In particular, teach what is good to younger women. And this is his shift. Now he shifts the focus from talking to the mature folks to the younger folks. And he's saying, I need you mature folks in Christ to grow in Christ for your own self, but also to teach the younger folks to grow in Christ as well. Paul has in mind an intergenerational discipleship program in the church. 
And I, I definitely see this happening quite a bit at our church at Westtown. It's very encouraging. There's a lot of you who work with our youth, um, and, and, and there are a lot of you who work with young adults. And I, I think that, that in order for us to, to be true to what he's saying here in Titus, that kind of thing needs to continue. We need to make sure that newlyweds have, have mature believers coming alongside them um, to, to walk with them through the first couple of years of marriage, to, to think about new moms and dads. Think about what it's like to go through that for the first time. How wonderful would it be to have mature women in Christ or mature men in Christ coming alongside you to, to show you how to be a mom or a dad. There is not an instruction manual when you leave the hospital for the first time. Also, I want you to notice, it doesn't say that you need to have a theology degree to do this. What you need is to know Jesus, to have some experience walking with Jesus. And if you know Jesus and love him and have experience walking with him, and he's brought you through some stuff, he's brought you through some trials, then you can mentor a younger Christian. You absolutely can. Everyone in the church can do this. So let's look at what this, what will happen? What will be the effect of healthy doctrine on the lives of younger people if we're, if we're teaching them how to walk with Jesus? Well, the first thing uh, that, that Paul addresses, he addresses young women. And the first, and kind of the um, characteristic I want to highlight is gospel kindness. He says, love, teach them to love your husband and kids or to be kind to your husband, to their husband and their kids. Why would... Why would they need to be taught how to do this? I mean, aren't husbands and kids, like, always just so lovable? I mean, gosh, how could you not? I mean, well, I think husbands and kids require a lot of patience in that order. And Paul is saying, you're going to have to choose to love them sometimes. They are not always going to be real lovable. They're not always going to be easy to love. They're going to do things that are going to flabbergast you. And, and you're going to have to choose to love and be kind to them. It will not always be easy. You know, it's revolutionary in our culture to say something like that because so much of what we, we see about love around us now is that it's a feeling and it, and it doesn't really last and, and you really don't even need to do it if, if someone doesn't deserve it. But thankfully, we have Christ who has loved us, though we deserve it least of all. Even when we have not been lovely, even when we have been his enemies, he has loved us and calls us to love others the same way. And young women, he is calling you, and not just you, but everyone, to love those who are, you're close to. I say that because I want to make sure that you understand if you are a young woman who is single, um, or, in, or you're single, you don't have kids, or, or whatever your situation is, he's calling you to love those closest to you, even when it's hard. He's saying classmates, best friends, parents, siblings, coworkers, neighbors, whatever, whoever you're around, love them the way Christ has loved you. Next thing he says is that young women ought to be self-controlled and pure. And when I hear this, I think of, um, I, mean, I think about, Dating, okay. So you're you're a young lady and you're dating a young man, and um, it takes both people to be self-controlled, right? If you're striving for purity, if if you want to follow Jesus and and be pure, both of you must be self-controlled. And what I want to say is that young women, if if the young man that you're interested in is not able to control himself around you, that does not mean that you have to follow his lead in that. In fact, if he's not able to control himself around you, I would say put some distance there because you can still be self-controlled and pure even if the world might think you to be a little prudish or something like that. Remember, Jesus is your master. The world is not your master. Jesus is your master. and He is calling you to be self-controlled and pure. All right, the next two topics we're going to get into are going to be really fun and if I still have a job after I say these things, I will be so excited. <laughs> because the next thing Paul says is, teach the young women to work at home and to be kind. <laughs> Woo! So here's what I'm going to say. 
Number one, this does not mean that young women should only work at home. It's not what he says. What I think he's getting at, the heart of what he's getting at, is that the home and the relationships in particular in the home should be our primary ministry. And that's, that's true of men, too. It's not just true of women. Um, the relationships in your home, marriages, children, there is no earthly relationship that is more important. There is only one relationship that is more important, that's yours with God. Beyond that, husbands and children are to be the most important relationship. Young moms, there is only one person that can be the wife to your husband. And there is only one person who can be the mom to your kids, and that is you. There are lots of people who can do the job that you do in the workplace. And so again, if your family situation allows it, and and maybe your family situation necessitates that you get a job, get a job. Work hard. Work hard for Christ. Be a witness to, to him in your workplace, but not at the not at the neglect of your family. Your primary ministry is to show kindness to your family. The next thing is maybe even more tricky. Be subject to your husbands. All right, this keeps getting better. So this is super negative today, right? Like nobody wants to hear this. Um, And that's partly because it's been, it's a concept that's been really, really abused, especially in the church. So many church people have heard this and thought, all right, this means that, um, at least for, for husbands, this means I get to do whatever I want all the time, and my wife has to serve me all the time. Missing the point, okay? Uh, this is also difficult because Satan has completely skewed our views of, of, of gender roles and, and marriage, and in our culture today, it's, it's almost flipped upside down and completely backwards, um, but, but biblical submission, if, if we can just define this correctly, I think we'll see that it's actually beautiful. Biblical submission is you willingly aligning yourself under your husband's leadership. Uh, Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your husbands. It does not say, Husbands, make your wives submit. There's a huge difference. A huge difference. Remember, Ephesians 5.21 actually says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So we are both in a place of submission because we're both in a marriage submitting to Christ and serving one another. Marriage is actually to be a relationship of mutual submission. It is certainly not a situation where the husband is supposed to, like, make you submit. And it's certainly not a license. I mean, God forbid that we ever think of it as some kind of a license to control or especially to abuse. It is certainly not that. That is far, far, far outside the realm of what God is teaching. It is actually a conscious, loving choice of a wife to place herself under the leadership of her husband. And by the way, if you're, if you're wondering about this, the Bible teaches equality. Equality, men and women created in God's image equally. And it's only saying, wives submit to your own husbands. It's not saying submit to all men. And so absolutely, a woman could be a CEO, a woman could be president, a woman could be whatever leader and whatever position she wants to be, and it's still biblical. Last thing I'll say on this, it maybe will help you, it helps me. There's a senior pastor I heard one time say that the reason he has his job and the reason he gets paid is to make two or three decisions every year that no one else wants to make. You know what I'm talking about? Like you have a decision and it's like there's, there's no good answer. Whatever decision you're going to make, someone's going to be angry or, or it's, it's just you don't, you don't know what's right. It's hard, it's hard to know. And in a marriage, I think it's a similar kind of idea because, you know, you're, you're going to have situations that as a husband and wife where whether it's like something with money or like relocating for a job or something like that, it's just, this is not a good decision. It's hard, it's hard to know what's right. And you may see things differently. Well, I think what the scriptures are saying is that the burden of leadership in those situations belongs to the husband. God has given the husband the burden of leadership there, the burden to make the best decision he knows how to make according to the wisdom God has given him. 
I really think that is, that is kind of the highlight of what God is talking about when he, when he talks about having different roles as husband and, wife, as husband and wife. And the result of all this, he says, is that the word of God is not maligned. It's not um, slandered. And he would, the reason he says that is because biblical marriage is meant to prove the gospel. It's meant to be a picture of the gospel, to display God's love and grace and mercy we want our marriages, when other people look at our marriages, we want them to see the gospel and understand the gospel better. Okay, last one is the young men. What is the effect of sound doctrine when it's taught to young men? There is only one thing. Self-control. It's kind of like Paul is saying, yo, my dudes, you got one job. Be self-controlled. If you be self-controlled, you will conquer the world for Christ, man. Like, that's it. Young dudes, we tend to be excessive. We drive fast. We eat a lot. You know, we, we don't go to CC's for the taste, right? We go see how many pieces of pizza we can eat. We stay up late. We're not the best at making wise, calculated decisions or having sound judgment. This is, you know, this is why our auto insurance is crazy expensive until it were at least 25, right? And the culture, it kind of encourages this. You know, like, don't we, like, just encourage 18 to 22-year-old guys to go off to college and just party and let your hair down? Like, isn't that what we say? And that's kind of what we expect, right? Why? Why do we expect that from them? Why do we think that's okay? It's not. It is college or, or whatever time that you're a young man is not like this parenthesis in your life where, where everything's just excused. Okay, you are still, as a young man, called to live a self-controlled life because you are still, if, if you know Jesus, you are called to be on display for him. You know, when you think of a, a young man who has it all, well, not all, but who has it together, who's disciplined, who um, knows what he wants out of life, who is able to to kind of say no to distractions. Don't you find that amazing? Aren't you just like blown away by that? Like, wow, how did he get there? You know, he's only like 21 and he's more mature than me. That's the whole point. We're meant to, to look at a young man who has self-control and say, wow, it must be Jesus working in his life because that's just different. So let's close um, Mature men of dignity, mature women who are reverent, young women who love others well, young men who are self-controlled. Paul addresses everyone, and he gives different instructions to each. And, and it's clear, not just here, but all throughout the Bible, that yes, there are, there are differences that God has created in men and women. Gender roles are different according to Scripture. Not unequal, just different. And that growth in Christ will even look different for each. But there is one commonality for all of them. I don't know if you noticed this, but self-control is, is, is in there for mature men, young women, and young men. Apparently not the mature women, like they got this thing down, right? They got the whole self-control thing down. They don't need any help. Except for it says to be reverent. And if you're reverent, then you're self-controlled. Because it's, the whole idea of reverence is that Christ is your master. And that's what this all points to. Everyone is controlled by something. And whatever you are controlled by, you'll do anything to get. And for some people, that's, you know, the classic idea is as a drug addict who is just doing anything he or she can to get the next high, right? But then you can do this with, with parents who worship their kids. They will do anything to make their kids happy, even to their kids' detriment. Or, or adults who worship their work, they'll do anything to, to advance up the career ladder. Or people who uh, worship being in a relationship, He'll do anything to get a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Or you can do this with college football. Man, yesterday I wanted to watch the Seminoles lose so bad. I, mean, I didn't want to watch them lose, but I wanted to watch them real bad, right? And I wanted to play with my kids, so I took the TV out and put it outside so I could do both. Like, that's what I'm talking about. And I was miserable because they were terrible. But we worship things. And, and we do them in excess, and we kind of like the ancients who would actually make wooden or stone idols and set it on a shelf and be like, oh, cool, I'm going to worship this thing that I just made. Does that make any sense at all? That's what we do. We worship idols. And that's why 
when it talks about being self-controlled in the scriptures, worshiping Jesus is so different because he pursues us first. He comes and, and redeems us. He, he is the hound of heaven who comes after us and is relentless. And who if, if we are going to belong to him, we are going to belong to him. And, it's, and he is irresistible. He does this and he comes and redeems us, frees us from the curse of idolatry, the curse of sin. And he comes to us and he says, you know what? If you are weary, if you are weighed down by, by much guilt, by many burdens, come to me and you will find rest. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come to me and find peace. When we come and we find that rest and we find that peace, then we can be marked by self-control. We can be marked by the fruit of the Spirit. It will be evident that the Spirit is working in our lives. It's kind of like uh, this quote from Francis Chan. He says, I don't want my life to be explainable without the Holy Spirit. I want people to look at my life and know that I could not be doing this on my own power. That is what healthy doctrine does in a community. That is just a small taste of the effect that sound doctrine produces when taught throughout the generations. And the sharper the contrast between our lives as we seek to follow Jesus and live lives of repentance versus the lives of those around us, the sharper the contrast, the brighter the light of Christ will shine out in the darkness around us.